seafood or bees or I don't know, just aware that I'm not there yet. Me neither. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> by, but by doing them, even though we don't feel like it, then we might get there at one point, then it might get become, might become um, spontaneous. It's a habit also. But yeah, you're right, you know, this is what I was talking about when we do something out of duty or because of our reputation or, or just because we want to be nice but we're not really thinking about what we're getting into. Uh, I mean, I noticed that one when I was in Copan and it was many years ago where also you didn't have everything available. So there were the first apples came out and uh, I was, somebody gave me an apple and I was eating it, eating it. And I asked the person who was standing next to me, do you want a bite? And I was expecting them to say no. Yeah, so he said, oh yes, please. He took the apple, he ate it all. So then I felt this kind of thing. And then, then you go inside and you look and I thought, yeah, well, I mean, you offered it to him. You know? <laughs> but I didn't see my, before I didn't see my expectation that out of politeness he would say, no, no, it's okay. Because I would have said, no, no, it's okay. If I see somebody eating something with so much pleasure, then they offer me something. I said, no, no, it's fine. So I was, I was expecting that as a good Swiss, because that's what we do. Yeah. So, uh, but then he said, yes, and the apple was gone. So then I learned not to offer something if I don't want to give it. Or before I offer it, to work with it and say, hey, you can give it, you will not die, there is more apples on this planet than just that one. Because my reaction was a bit as if that was the last apple on this planet. I was shocked. I was, you see, I mean, I was so shocked that I still remember the situation. I was like 20 years, no, it wasn't even a nun, that was almost 30 years ago. Yeah, so like this. So, but when we talk about good deeds, again, you know, we talk a little bit as if there's somebody sitting there with a, uh, you know, good deed, bad deed, good is not, nothing like this. So then it's always this question, you know, uh, should I do positive things um, because I want to have positive karmic imprint so that I can be happy in the future? I would say yes, definitely. Should I abstain from doing negative things because I don't want to suffer, because I don't want to suffer in the future? I would definitely say yes. That's the smallest motivation, but it's a good motivation because it helps you not to do others. Now, but again, you know, if you go further and you, you start to do good deeds because you want to have a good reputation, because you want others to be nice to you and all this, then it creates a problem because, not, not because of your karma, you do, you do, you help somebody or you're generous, it's, you create the karma of generosity. But then when you get, when, when nothing comes back and you get angry, then it becomes a problem for you. Yeah, because your expectation that, that somebody is giving something back, at least grat gratitude to something. Yeah, then, yeah. It's like you, you know, you, there's one piece of cake, there's two people, uh, not your children, but your children, it's very easy, but there's two people then, you kind of think, should I eat it? Should I give it to the other one? Uh, so you give it to the other one, and then he says, wow, you know, this is really good. Oh, it's such a shame that you're missing the taste of this cake. If you can be happy having given it, if you don't expect the person to help you later on when you are having some difficulties, then it's okay. All we have to let go is, is of expectation that something should come back now. That we do the so-called good deeds, I don't like this word, but anyway, we do the good deeds just for the sake of doing them, to train. It's a training. I wonder what happens if I do this good deed. You know, it's enough as a motivation. Does that help a little bit? Or? I'm not sure. Not sure, okay. So what exactly would you like from me? That I'm letting you, giving you, giving you a method to be happier when you do good deeds, or, or what? Um, like when you, maybe I need to you to think about what you said. Yeah. Maybe when you do things and you do good deeds, I, I yeah, yeah, it's okay. Like better, so you do it, but um, like I've already said it, like. I'm not maybe 
feel ready to do it, and I still sort of feel like it's on my expense, but I still do it. And, and like I'm not aware of my boundaries, of my real uh -huh. ability of doing good, and which in that case, I'm not being good to myself in a way mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. Like it would be better if we be good for me mm -hmm. in a while yeah. after I work. But now it's all my expense. So, but it's hard for me at least sometimes. Yeah. To, to when you set the line, boundary where, where yeah. This is another thing, you know, where you have to be courageous enough to set boundaries when you feel that you're giving too much. That's okay. Because this whole thing about doing good deeds is not about destroying yourself. It's to build you up so that you can attain full awakening. But then we also have to see, you know, I mean, do I need these boundaries? It's like sometimes we create boundaries that are not necessary. And I, I talked to somebody the other day who was also working with, you know, we were coming up with the rules about when, when you accompany people uh, who are dying, you know, what is helpful, what is not helpful. And she said, you know, an open heart, because it's always you have to protect yourself when you are with people in that state. But she said, and she works a lot with dying people, she said, you know what I discovered? An open heart is the best protection. So you see these boundaries, it's like, um, yeah, do we need them? I mean, when I'm really tired and what I'm saying is just blah, 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 and somebody says, I want to talk to you, and I say, you, you can come if you want, but I'm not sure if I'll be able to give you a coherent answer. You know, I can say that when I'm tired, and it's okay to wait, and then we make another appointment, that's fine. Know that I'm giving everybody what they want, but in general, when I'm here in Israel for these three months, the time that I have belongs to others and not to me. And in Switzerland, the same. So I have no holidays, I don't have free days, you know, like I know that that day is free. I have months where I don't have one day where I don't have anything with somebody else that I is not for me but is for others. Should I say boundaries? Huh? What do you think? Should I say boundaries? Also with, you know, I mean, I don't want to put myself up, but also with the money, I mean, maybe I get something at the end of the visit, maybe I don't. I don't, I don't care. I don't come for that. Then you can say, yeah, well, you support it. Yeah, but I didn't ask for support. People from their own side, they started to support me because they found that it's good that I'm there. So they let me live in the apartment for free in Switzerland. Yeah, it's like, if you decide that you want to give, you don't need boundaries. But if somebody comes and says, I want uh, uh, 60,000 francs, then I also have to say, oh, no, sorry, this is too much. I can't give you that. Yeah. Because it depends a bit what you, if you talk about time, or if you talk about money, or if you talk about resources, or, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very tricky thing, you know, because you can also give and do things for others because you feel low about yourself and you want something back and you want to feel better. Not very healthy. But it does make you feel better because it gets you out of your self-concern. So here we are again, you know, we're discussing things where there's always a yes but. There's always two sides to it. So then again, who can discover whether you really need these boundaries or not is you. Yeah. And uh, usually the teachers are there to help us stretch the boundaries. Actually, they not only stretch them, they kick us out of our comfort zone. Because, you know, I never planned to teach. I thought I become a nun and then I study, I have a quiet life, I go, to the, I go to teachings, I go to retreats, I do my thing and that's it. Then, it was, then it became different. But I'm not saying I don't like what I'm doing. So. Do you see what I mean? But my comfort zone would have been being alone. Because I can be alone very well. I don't need other people. I, I like to be alone. But I can also be with people, as you can see, so, 
And so, so my teacher helped me stretch this boundary that I need time to be alone. I don't need it anymore. It's fine. And I'm happy that he did because I discovered that I can be very flexible. But I had to learn also. So life is for learning, isn't it? Does that help, Lana, or still not so much? Yeah. But if you think from your own side, no, this I cannot do, I have to set my boundaries, that's fine. That's okay. But then don't feel bad about it. This is it, you know, then, because we, on one hand we would like to help, and, but then on the other hand we can't. And then we feel like very selfish if we set boundaries. But the, overdoing it is like this situation that we said, you know, if somebody is really glued to you and you just, you feel, all, all you feel is aversion for that person. It's not very skillful to be together with that person. You're not doing anybody a favor. And also we cannot even, you see, we want to make people happy, but if they don't find their own happiness in their hearts or in their minds, then you can be with them or not be with them, or not how much you want. Uh, they won't be happy. So sometimes if you have people who are always complaining, um, sometimes it's also good just to say, I wish I could help you, but I don't know how. Do you have an idea how I could help you? And very often they discover, ah, no, actually, no, it's okay. But they need to see it themselves. They need to see that you be, you be ready, wanting to help them, but you don't know how, but maybe they know how. So it's very good also when you are with dying people to ask them, what do you want? What do you want? What do you think is good for you? And we can ask that if the people, we don't have to wait until they die to ask these things. We can also ask now, what would you like? What do you think is good for you? Yeah, then when you're ready to give it, you give it. And then if it's too big, you say, no, sorry, that's too big. No, if you don't want to get married and your mother and your father definitely want, they don't want a, 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 a son-in-law, they want grandchildren. So um, they want grandchildren then, and you don't want to have any children, then you say, okay, you know, I love you very much, but sorry, that's too big a step for me, just to make you happy. It's a big thing in this country still, isn't it, this grandchildren thing. It's not so much that the, the, the people want children, it's more that the parents want grandchildren, I think. As I hear now, that is now the problem. It's not so much that young people say, oh, I really want to have children. It's more your parents that say, oh, why don't you have any children because I want grandchildren. And then comes August, and then they all complain. <laughs> when they have to fulfill their softer duties. Okay, maybe one more question if you have, and then we make short break, and then we do final meditation. I, uh, um, I just wanted to continue. Uh, okay, good. Nina's yes. question uh, is that uh, uh, we sometimes get entangled uh, making people to talk to them that we are happy to help, and we get uh, in a abusive pattern. Especially, I think uh, it's nice that Nia asked this question, but I see it in many cases with women. They really want to make people happy, and they end up uh, not knowing how to mm -hmm. establish a, a healthy relationship. Yeah. So that's, that's why I think what uh, I heard uh, in this Nia's question about boundaries. Because um, uh, uh, I mean, some people are not well enough to accept the help and stand on their own. And they get uh, too used to get things done. You know, men that don't know how to go in the kitchen, or, you know, all kinds of uh, men and mm -hmm. men that feel they deserve. All kinds of abusive relationships where people are being too good. 
So it's time for the women to get together and as we did in Switzerland, you go on strike. We had a woman's strike. One, so here, here one whole my, day. Here comes my question. <laughs> can you go on that strike? Yes. You can go on that strike and say, I'm sick and tired of being abused because I'm a woman. Yes, of course. And how did it change, the men in Switzerland? Uh, it changed in a way, it takes a long time for these things to change. But it changed that some guy, because you, you know, the women who say that they have to wear purple when you go on the strike, they were in all the big cities, like it was a big thing. Um, and so you were wearing purple, and many men came wearing purple sheets, saying also, you know, we, are, we, we agree with you, there is too much violence against women, and women do get abused, so if you have a, a little part already of the guys pumping that side, then slowly, slowly it will change. And what I found really sweet, because I'm in Bern, it's the capital, so um, at 11 o'clock, most of the government came out also, and were wearing purple, men, women, and then they hung two purple sheets outside the government windows for half an hour only, but still. Like, it is being recognized now that this is a problem. At least it comes in the open. First it needs to come in the open, and then, you know. And I think the young generation, uh, men generation, they're different than the older generation. It's a cultural thing that the women stay at home, and they work and do this and that, and, that. and the well, violence against you women you is know really... This is hmm? you know this is you know this is What? Is this yeah. yeah. Um, no sex strikes. Uh -huh. I don't know. I mean, I'm on no sex strikes for a long time. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I don't. Have but uh, again, a strike should not be violent. A, stri a strike should be underlined by really good, um, by a really good, uh, good arguments or whatever. And talking about sex, like also for young people. In one, uh, also I'm sorry for those people who have already heard it, uh, in one of the climate demonstrations, which is organized by young people, by teenagers. And so there was about a 50 year old guy, and he started to shout, you know, facts into the mic microphone, this, this, and this, and with a lot of aggression. And then he was going, like, give me an F, give me a U, give me a C, give me a K, what does it mean? Fuck, fuck, fuck the system, fuck the system. Then a, maybe a 16-year-old girl, she took the microphone and she said, look, sorry, we do not want to identify with this. This is not what we want. And she says, and fuck has to do with sex. And sex should not be made, should not be mixed with violence. Sex should be, <coughs> sex should be mixed with love. 16-year-old girl, in front of about a thousand people. Imagine the courage that they have. And also, during the women's strike, also then we went up to the university, where young girls were, you know, slow, uh, um, how to call it, uh, poetry slams, and telling their story, and there may be elder women who were lesbians, who are in the government, who told how difficult it was for them to to be there, to be accepted, and others, to share, to share amongst women, I think, the difficulties, and not to work against each other, but really to work together also in harmony. That's the most difficult thing for women, I think. I mean, this is our part as women, not to, you know, to do things together. It was, a, it, during that day in Switzerland, I'll tell you, if it was just that, but it was something, there was very, very good energy. It was very uplifting that women's strike who went totally non non-violent. I mean they were coming and making noise, yes of course, but not not violent. It was nice. It was nice. Remember? So yeah, whether something will change also depends on karma. Yeah. So so this is it, you know, with the abuse. Now this is really heavy what I'm saying. But if if a man abuses his power or his so called power of the woman in another life, what do you think will happen to this man? Now we learned about, we learn about results. So now we have to be careful that you're not going, ah, so the woman that are abused now, there was an abusing man in the past, so they deserve it. Don't go there. But try to have compassion for both, for the, for the man abuser 
and for the woman as the victim, so that this can stop and that we can start um, respecting each other. But again, you know, coming down to women, sometimes women get very upset when you read in the scriptures, for example, in the sutra, like, um, may I be reborn as a man? Sometimes you read in the scriptures that there's a dedication like this. Because even still now, today, life is easier as a man. Yeah? In certain ways. Like, for example, you are a woman and you want to go and meditate in a cave alone in the mountains. It's too dangerous because some crazy guy hears about it and then he comes and, and rapes you. As a man, it can also happen, but you know, the chance that this happens to a monk or to a man is much smaller. And yeah, the abuse is mainly happening to women. I'm not saying it's right or it's wrong, please don't get me, don't get me wrong, but it's a fact. It's a fact, or also this kind of, this, what, what, what the strike also was about is that um, you know, it may, girls, boys, have, they, is, they have the same chances to become something like school, studies, university, and all this. But then the women get pregnant, so let's say both of them become a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, something. But then the woman gets pregnant, so she is lacking years in her career, which then makes her have, for example, less pension, as if she hasn't worked in these years. That is the inequality, you know? Both of them have the same chances if a woman, for example, but then she needs to decide not to have children because it's still the women who have the children, it's not the men. Of course, the, the mother can then afterwards immediately go to work, but it's usually not like that. You have to see what I mean? So this is that at least that is being recognized also as work when they stay at home and look after the kids, in terms of then having the pension in the, in the future. Well, there nothing has been decided yet, but it might change. If we keep saying it, you know, this is how things change, by mentioning it, by bringing it out in the open again and again and again and again. But yeah, if you're a woman and you feel that you're abused by your husband, go and ask for help from somebody. It's okay to go to the police if you are physically or sexually abused. Even as a Buddhist and a Bodhisattva, nobody says you have to endure that. Why? Because he is creating negative karma also. It's not good for the person to abuse you. That's why you have a duty to protect yourself. Now again, this thought can be genuine or it can be a total hypocritical whatever. What, what does it depend on? Is it depends on you. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Nobody says you should let people abuse you physically or mentally or whatever. But it happens. And it happens a lot. But you can protect yourself by knowing about karma, knowing about emptiness, and knowing about uh, negative emotions. Knowing that the abuser doesn't have that much choice whether to do it or not that it's a habitual behavior, which again, I'm not saying it's right, okay? But the more you think that somebody who is hurting you or is abusing you, the more you think that they would have a choice not to do it, the more you do get hurt. Yeah, okay? Mm. Or were you just catching something? Okay. okay? We make a dedication at the end that nobody, we will read the dedication prayer where it says nobody should get abused, may the weak find power, those forlorn find happiness, and like this, you know. This is why we practice, so that we, I also have a responsibility to practice in a way so that I don't become a victim, because if I have a lot of negative karma, I become a magnet for the abuser. That's how intricate this whole thing is. This is how complicated it is. This is where our responsibility lies, to purify our negative karma so we're not attracting um, abusers, basically. Okay? It's okay? I, I, I can ask another question that this discussion leads me to. I mean, 
the stamp. Hmm? Um, I'm saying that I have another question. Okay. Being an activist and someone that uh, wishes to change the world. Very good. I experienced recently since uh, practicing uh, Buddhism uh, a frustration in regard to my, uh, my weight. to sit at home and meditate and being more content and turning the radio off mm -hmm. and not being able to tolerate what's going on around me. And I'm a bit concerned about this, uh, the need to go out and go on strikes mm -hmm. and, and, you know, work in, in, in political terms. And um, I, I feel a, a, an inner dispute. Mm -hmm. Where am I going now? Yeah. Um, there is something about the the way I experience Buddhism lately is that it makes me shut off. I can't deal with what's going on. I'm too tired to mm -hmm. go to the out. Uh, I, I feel the place is very, very sick and corrupt. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I say to myself, okay, so I do, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be a good practitioner. Maybe yeah. I'll do something good. Yeah. But I know that I'm, I, I don't know where I'm taking this because there is some political work to do. Yes. Like, you, like you said. Uh, yeah, show, show your discontent. Yeah. Show it, but not with aggression. If it was with aggression, we're not getting anywhere. But maybe also for you it's time to go into retreat until you feel strong enough again to come out, to not to be so frustrated, to see that nothing moves. It's okay to do that now, you know, with... Uh, <laughs> boundaries and stuff. It's okay to say, oof, I really need to go out because otherwise I just get aggressive. Because, you know, we, you need, we need to come with good arguments and being really calm. Doesn't mean that we have to be quiet, but calm and with good arguments so that the politicians will want to listen to us and not just shout and be aggressive and all that. But I think it's good to go out. I go out, this is what I just told you, I go on these demonstrations. And I'm very inspired how peaceful it is now, I, I prefer it. Yeah. I show my presence, doesn't make much difference, but I go. So, also then I, maybe I don't feel so powerless and I don't need to get so frustrated. And whatever I can do, I do, to be peaceful with the neighbors who dislike us, to take care of the environment so I'm not consuming things that I don't need to consume, that I'm going, little things, you know. When I need flour for the altars, then I go and, and kind of cut them from the flower field, which is a bit further down, and I'm not buying the roses from Kenya. But then again, I can say, oh, but you know, people work on these fields in Kenya. If you don't buy these flowers, they don't have any salary. And then I see, yeah, that's true. So I just need to make a decision, and both of the decisions are not good. I don't buy them, it's not good. I buy them, it's also not good. And then I go and sit on the cushion and work on my mind. I can't save the world. I also wanted to save the world when I was 18 years old. Uh, now I'm quite happy that I found methods to say to change my mind. Yeah. And who is it, Gandhi, who says, be the change that you would like to see in the world. We go out totally not aggressive, totally open, totally kind, like that. But yeah, it's frustrating to see what's happening. You know, I mean, when you see what the politicians are doing, and not just yours, like many others also, also the ones in Switzerland where, you know, the protectiveness and only us and 
and then, you know, they have private jets and fly around the 